dear friends uh, ladies and gentlemen it is really a great pleasure and honor indeed for me to be here this evening on the platform of indian academy of echocardiography on a very special occasion and the occasion is a webinar on tricuspid regurgitation and enigma from quantitation to management it's a very very important subject and i really love this subject tricuspid regurgitation and i am very happy that we have a very eminent speaker today none other than our own dr vinayak agarwal an eminent echocardiologist clinical cardiologist a researcher debater and academician and is also the director head and non invasive and clinical cardiology fortis memorial research institute gurugram i welcome you sir we are all aware that the tricuspid valve is a forgotten valve is a neglected and rejected valve but i personally feel it's a very very important valve and i'm sure here we have dr vinay agarwal to tell us in details about it we are also aware that the tricuspid regurgitation is physiological maybe secondary or functional and organic tr and the importance of not only valve but tricuspid annulus is very very significant let us see what dr vinayak agarwal <clears throat> has to tell us about the diagnostic prognostic and therapeutic implication of tricuspid regurgitation in the clinical practice ladies and gentlemen i present to you dr vinayak agarwal vinayak sir thank you sir um thank you very much sir for that kind introduction and <clears throat> i'm going to move on to the presentation straight away so um at the outset i'd like to just say two three things that this uh, i've tried to make this presentation practical i'm not showing too much of uh, you know videos and echoes but i'm concentrating on the concept uh, on the concept of tricuspid regurgitation and how we really quantitate it um when we talk about tricuspid valve as uh, dr chopra has said that about 10 years back maybe 15 years back it was considered a neglected forgotten innocuous bystander of the left sided valve disease <clears throat> but then at that time our knowledge of tricuspid valve was sketchy at best however those things have steadily changed over the last decade or so the problem is that tricuspid regurgitation is extremely common it's mostly asymptomatic not easily auscultable because auscultable because the murmur is soft it is often missed and for some reason if somebody goes for an echocardiography then it is picked up on echo or an imaging now tricuspid valve is the largest and most apically positioned valve and it's very similar to mitral valve it can be divided into a fibrous annulus three leaflets papillary muscles and caudal attachments and here you can see that there is uh, this is a valve which has been the uh, right ventricle which has been opened up so you can see a posterior tricuspid leaflet the septal leaflet which is attached to the septum the atl which has been uh, you know turned around so that is the atl or anterior tricuspid leaflet you have the anterior septal and posterior papillary muscles and this is the typical rb apex with hypertrabeculations uh, moderator band septal marginal bands etc this is a gross picture of that moderator band apical uh, the anterior papillary muscle the posterior papillary muscles and this is the hypertrabeculate or trabeculated region of the rb which is near the apex and this is how the leaflets thin leaflets of tricuspid valve look like so this is the uh you know say like in the uh, the tricuspid leaflets the one thing which we have to <clears throat> understand is about the tricuspid annulus now 
this is a complex structure we are very dynamic and it has no fibrous continuity with the corresponding semilunar valve which is very unlike mitral valve in fact the most common cause of tricuspid regurgitation is the secondary or functional dr where there is due to whatever pathology the tricuspid annulus which is normally triangular and has both saddle shape becomes dilated in the sap septolateral septolateral direction so it actually expands in the septolateral direction and becomes oval and this is what is one of the major mechanisms which leads to significant tricuspid regurgitation other than the leaflet tithering if you look at the orientation of the leaflet so this is the aorta aortic valve here is the transverse pericardial sinus you have a sept this is the septum so you have the septal leaflet anterior tricuspid atl and this is the ptl the anteroseptal commissure is actually facing the aorta and this is the transverse sinus which is uh, between the posterior aortic root and <clears throat> and the anterior wall of the atria if we look at these structures which are adjacent to the tricuspid valve which is very important to understand these structures we can see that this is the right atrium and we're seeing it from the atrial side so this is the tricuspid valve with septal leaflet attached to the septum atl ptl and adjacent to this septum is the tendon of prodaro which is this one a coronary sinus the fibasian valve and the septal leaflet which is this one so this creates the cox triangle and uh, the uh, av node sits somewhere here so this is the apex which has the av node so this anatomy is very important especially to the electrophysiologists and to the surgeons when they are actually working on the tricuspid valve and also for the now upcoming transcatheter tricuspid intervention another schematic diagram with a new view from the ra is that the right coronary artery passes around the anterior aspect of the tricuspid annulus in the av groove the non coronary cusp of the aortic valve and the posterior medial commissure of the mitral valve are located deep to the antero septal commissure of the tricuspid valve so this is the orientation and here i had shown you already that this is the septum you can see the av node at the triangle of cox at the apex of the triangle of cox this is the tendon of prodaro coronary sinus here the ivc here so this is the basic orientation of the tricuspid valve the problem about the tricuspid valve imaging and hence the tricuspid regurgitation is that tricuspid valve why do we need to know when we are assessing tricuspid regurgitation obviously you would want to know what is happening to the tricuspid valve is there a perforation vegetation you know carcinoid any of these pathologies which are affecting the tricuspid valve then that becomes a primary tricuspid pathology or primary tr if it is leading to tr if there is an annular dilatation and tithering of the leaflets then that becomes a secondary or functional tricuspid regurgitation so we need to know the anatomy of the tricuspid valve and the adjacent structures there is a variable anatomy there is the reason for that is that tricuspid valve the annulus are highly pre and after load dependent there is also a low pressure environment with slower jet velocity so the very obvious signs like the jet width the jet uh you know the size etc become much more much less reliable then when you put the uh um, the leads the icd or the pacemaker leads they can also impinge onto these uh, uh tricuspid valve leaflets and lead to significant tricuspid regurgitation there may be adjacent artifacts during imaging and the major problem is that you don't really have robust clinical validated cut off points uh in imaging which can help us in taking prompt decisions for surgery or interventions we do have a lot of uh, ways in which we can look at the tricuspid valve the tr the echo both t and transthoracic 3d echoes 3d d cmr and ct and all of them have their pros and cons which i'm not going to go into 
But coming on to echo, which is what we are discussing, if simply we look at the four chamber view, we can see that in the four chamber view, there is uh, septum, uh, the septal leaflet. Now this leaflet, which can be both anterior or posterior, and I will show you how to uh, distinguish. This is the inflow view. This is the subcostal coronal view. And this is the subcostal short axis view. Now, how do you distinguish which leaflet is which? So if you look at the parasternal inflow view, so you make a flax, you dip the uh, probe in. So you make a uh, parasternal, in, parasternal inflow view, tricuspid inflow view. So what you see is uh, a coronary sinus. If you are able to see the coronary sinus and the interventricular septum, then what you see or visualize is the anterior, tri anterior tricuspid leaflet or ATL and the septal leaflet. The moment you go a little rightward and inferior, so you go a little more inferior so that you exclude the coronary sinus and the interventricular septum, then you replace the septal leaflet with the posterior leaflet. So ATL remains the same in both the views, but as soon as you re uh, remove the coronary sinus from the view and this, uh, the interventricular septum, that becomes your true posterior tricuspid leaflet. So that is one thing which you should know. In a four-chamber view, if you're able to see the aorta, which means it's a slightly anteriorly tilted four-chamber view or a five kind of a five-chamber view, when it is angled anteriorly, you will visualize the ATL and STL. The septal and the anterior tricuspid leaflet are imaged. But the moment you go down, which means you uh, go into four chamber and further down to visualize the coronary sinus, a deep four chamber when you just keep going down and the posterior interventricular septum is what you're visualizing and the CS comes up. That is when you have a septal leaflet and the posterior leaflet. So this is on tri uh, transthoracic use. Very, very important to uh, know this uh, simple way to find out. Now, when you go into the short axis views, uh, you can look at, now the problem with that is the, uh, when you look at the right atrium, depending on the transducer location, you can have uh, various leaflets uh, can be seen. Like for example, in this, only the ATL is being seen. Okay. And if you angle the transducer a little towards the left ventricular outflow track, inflow track, sorry, you would start seeing uh, the uh, STL and ATL. So right now you can see both ATL and PTL, but if you start uh, angling the, towards the left ventricular inflow track, you will start seeing the septal and the anterior trileaflet, uh, tricuspid leaflets. When you come to transesophageal echo, mid-esophageal four chamber view, simple. All that you see on the right side is a septal and anterior tricuspid leaflets, ATL and STL. When you go to the level of aorta, you can see the septal remains the same, but A or P can be uh, at different levels. I'll show you how to distinguish that again. Now here, uh, as soon as you start visualizing the coronary sinus, you will see the STL and uh, ATL. And this is the transgastric uh, short axis view where you can see all the three left leaflets together. So transgastric view is very, very important when you're visualizing tricuspid valve. I'm coming to the TR shortly, but I thought these are important aspects of tricuspid valve, which I should be looking at at the present moment. In T, you can see that at uh, mid-esophageal zero degrees, you what you see is a septal and uh, ATL. When you go to 90 degrees, you see an ATL and PTL. This is uh, more like a biplane view or bi a biplane view of uh, at mid-esophageal level. When you go to a slightly deeper esophageal level, what you start visualizing is the ATL and PTL, like this one. So I think what, you, what I'm trying to say is that you have to understand that the moment the left ventricular structures go away, coronary sinus comes in, that's when you will start seeing the uh, ATL and PTL in the deep esophageal tricuspid valve views. 
Very important to understand is the importance of transgastric view for on fast view of the tricuspid valve. So the moment you uh, do a transgastric, uh, it allows the on fast. So you can see that PTL is in the near field. So probe is actually at the back. ATL is in the far field. And septum, of course, septal leaflet remains on the right side. 3DT also helps us uh, in understanding the position. So uh, one very simple way to understand is when you visualizing the uh, tricuspid valve, the septal leaflet will always be at the six o'clock position, whether you're looking at the ventricular aspect or atrial aspect, and that's how you identify the ATL and PTL. And you can see the orientation. So this is the aorta, tricuspid valve, mitral valve. So this septum, uh, this is the septal leaflet, posterior leaflet, anterior leaflet. We have already discussed that, so I'm not going to go into the details. Now coming on to TR. After that initial introduction about the orientation of the tricuspid valve apparatus, the tricuspid valve, the visualization of the tricuspid valve, the pathologies which may be affecting it. I'm not going to go into the details of the pathologies because I think that we have seen plenty, but I'm just going to touch upon the quanti quantification or assessment of the TR. So 70% of the population has TR and of varying degrees. But when you talk about severe TR, about 4% of the population above the age of 75 years will have symptomatic or asymptomatic TR. It is seen more in women, elderly, and also patients who have post open heart surgery for the left sided valvular heart disease. Earlier, we were of the opinion that, you know, if you take care of the left sided valve disease, mitral or aortic, then the tricuspid valve disease does not progress. But that has been proven wrong. The tricuspid valve disease can progress independent of the, the, stature or the status of the left-sided valvular heart disease over a period of time. And as the, the, the aging population occurs, further and further uh, longevity of life improves, you will see more and more TR prevalence in our clinical um, practice. Now, when we talk about the etiology, as I said, the primary leaflet etiology, so we call it the primary TR, is acquired disease. So you have rheumatic tricuspid stenosis, tricuspid regurgitation, infective endocarditis, carcinoid, endomyocardial fibrosis. The commonest is the tricuspid valve prolapse. So the mixomatous or degenerative TVP, just like MVP, which is the commonest cause of tricus primary uh, uh, tricuspid uh, disease. So even trauma is quite common, iatrogenic, like with the pacing leads, etc., can lead to then RVMI can sometimes. So those uh, where you have RV dysfunction due to RVMI, etc., that comes into secondary uh, TR, which I will touch upon. Then you have very common primary reasons for primary TR is the congenital anomalies like Epstein, tricuspid valve dysplasia. Then tricuspid valve tethering with perimemnanous VSDs, etc., TOF, congenital corrected TGAs, etc. But what we usually see in our clinical practice, so when you talk about tricuspid primary disease, most of them can be treated surgically. Most of them are to are treated with the underlying etiology to be treated. But it is the secondary or the functional TR which is actually at the heart of the debates and the heart of the management strategies that we need to talk about. The commonest cause of secondary or functional TR is the left heart disease leading to, so an LV dysfunction or valve disease, which leads to uh, LV, uh, leads to uh, dilatation of the LV or MR, AR, etc. affects secondarily the uh, tricuspid uh, valve and the causes TR. Then there can be direct RV dysfunction, as in RV ischemia, RVMI, RV volume overloads, RV cardiomyopathies, and of course, pulmonary hypertension uh, subset, which is very common uh, if you look for it. So chronic lung diseases, COPDs, ILDs, etc., chronic thromboembolic pH, or acute pulmonary embolism, left to right shunts, etc. And very important is the right atrial dilatation or contribution of right atrial dilatation in AF leading to secondary TR. That is something which uh, is a very common cause, especially in the elderly. Now, when we talk about the assessment of tricuspid 
regurgitation by echo. We can divide it in, into four ways. One is what we just talked about is the structural parameters or so in mild moderate severe what we look at the tricuspid morphology is in mild destruction you know affection of the leaflets or the leaflets so this is very subjective but obviously if you have a flail tricuspid valve if you have a severe retraction as in rheumatic tricuspid stenosis or a infective endocarditis is causing perforation you know that this is severe tricuspid regurgitation if the rarv are significantly dilated it is obviously more towards moderate to severe if the inferior vena cava dilates beyond 2.1 to 2. Uh, 21 to 25 mm or more you know it is moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation uh, regurgitation so this is a structural parameters that we're looking which help us to determine whether it is a primary or a secondary tr and what is the severity the second is to look at the qualitative doppler so the color flow jet area is something which we look at so if it is a very narrow small jet versus a large central or eccentric even uh, you know an eccentric wall impinging jet that will help you to determine whether the patient has moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation then the flow conversion zone if it is large throughout this uh, systole then again it goes in favor of the severity of tr then the continuous wave doppler when you put it the jet which you give of the tricuspid uh, uh, regurgitation you if it is dense often triangular or even parabolic or triangular that goes in favor of moderate to severe to see tricuspid regurgitation the semi quantitative methods uh, are your color flow jet area so if it is more than 10 cm square it is considered severe it is very subjective it is semi quantitative but 10 is the cut off point for tr for color flow jet area just exactly like you take it for mr the vena contracta width of more than 3 mm to up to 7 is moderate and more than 7 mm is considered severe uh, tr we can also look at the pisa radius uh, exactly as you make it out for the mr and if it is more than 0.9, it goes in favor of severe tear. If there is a systolic flow reversal in lymphatic veins, and if the E wave velocity in the tricuspid inflow is more than one millimeter, that also signifies severe tear. So these are semi quantitative methods. And a uh, simple way so, how do you uh, look at the uh, Vena contractor? This is from the JS 2017 guidelines. So you zoom the tricuspid valve area, uh, TR and in the apical four chamber view with uh, or in even in the RV inflow view. And you can look at the, uh, you know, uh, the vena contract in this view. And if it is uh, uh, the semi quantitatively, you can make out this vena contract the width as a marker of severity, which we just discussed. The problem is if there are multiple jets, then you cannot really be uh, certain about the vena contractor. The jet area again in the four chamber or RV inflow or even in the subcostal views, again qualitative. We have already discussed about the jet area more than 10 being 10 centimeter square being severe. Then color flow 3D uh, vena contractor is something which is also one of the options, but again, multiple jets is something which you have to be aware of as a limitation and here you have to choose for uh, the 3d vena contractor you have to choose the mid systolic cycle and uh, you have this has to be done uh, you know in a uh, by uh, by the software which is given to you so you use the uh, the software to look at the 3d vena contractor the other is the pulse wave so you uh, the pulse wave at hepatic vein flow. So, if you see a systolic uh, 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 flow reversal, then this is something suggestive of severe uh, tricuspid regurgitation. If you see a significant, very dense, uh, that's the density of the uh, regurgitant jet is uh, dense. If it is very dense, then it is uh, uh, goes in favor of severe TR. The jet contour is very important because there is a 
uh, pressure equalization and severity are very quickly. So there is an early peaking uh, of uh, the dense ER jet with uh, uh, concavity here. So this again goes uh, in favor of severe TR. So just to, uh, to kind of give you a summary of what we have just discussed, so mild and severe central TR or eccentric TR. So if you look at this mild TR, there is a small narrow jet. There is a narrow vena contracta. There is no flow uh, convergence here. And the TR jet is faint. So this is mild TR. Sometimes the TR is, when it is severe, you will see the vena contracta is more than 7 millimeter. There is a large flow convergence. The continuous wave Doppler across the tricuspid regurgitation is dense and triangulated because of severe TR and ventricularization of the RA pressure very quickly. Sometimes the TR can be eccentric or wall hugging. So there is an entrapment and train entrainment which occurs. And here, the vena contracta is wide. The color flow jet uh, is skirting the RA wall. And there is a dense parabolic jet with early peaking is seen in these cases. So these are some of the ways in which you can qualitatively or semi-quantitatively look at the severity of TR. And this is what we were talking about, the flow, proximal flow conversions, the vena contractor we have already discussed. There is the quantitative methodology, on the other hand, is to look at the effective regression orifice area and the regression volume, exactly the same way as we do for MR. And if it is more than 0.4 uh, centimeter square, it's suggestive of severe TR. If it is more than 45 ml uh, of regression volume, it is suggestive of severe tricuspid regurgitation. And one example here of quantitative is, so you look at the four chamber, you have severe TR, you look at the aliasing velocity, the radius of the PISA here, and you can, you take the TR jet, and by the same equation as you look at the uh, PISA in uh, MR, you calculate the ERO and the regression volume. Here it is 45, 44 ml, and ERO is 0.4, so significant which means that there is a severe tricuspid regurgitation. There is also a systolic reversal of hepatic vein flows, which is suggestive of severe TR. So this is an example by which we can quantitatively determine the severity of TR. Now, so this we have already discussed. There is very interesting uh, thing which is coming up now uh, of last two, three years is a proposed expansion of the grading of the severity of TR. Now, what uh, this is a concept which was uh, uh, proposed by Hahn and Zomerano, where they are uh, they've gone ahead and started proposing massive TR and torrential TR and additional indices or grades of severity of TR. So mild, moderate, severe, massive, and torrential. And the way they define that is. If the vena contracta width is 14 to 20 millimeters, it is massive. If it is more than 21 millimeters or 2.1 centimeters, it is torrential. If the effective regression orifice area by 2D PISA is between 0.6 to 0.8, it is massive. And if it is more than 0.8, then it is torrential. And if you look at the 3D, uh, vena contracta area or quantitative uh, ERO, then if it is 0.95 to 1.14, and torrential is when it is more than 1.15 or more. So this is something which is very important. And this is how you can actually look at pictorially. You can see the vena contracta width in phrase, mild, moderate, severe is about 3 to 7 to 13. The moment it touches 14 vena contract to up to 20, it becomes massive. And when it is more than 20, around 21 or so, or more, then it becomes torrential. Similarly, with ERO, we know that till about 40 or more. So they have cut off, taken 60 or more as massive, 60 to 80, and more than 80, or 0.8 centimeters square uh, is torrential. Now, when we talk about the, um, so based on these, 
uh, the Doppler parameters, we can actually define the uh, you know criteria as mild, moderate, severe based on the parameters. And this is just I'm going to touch upon the severe TR. So if there is a dilated annulus with no valve coaptation or there is a flay leaflet, large central jet which is covering more than 50% of the RA or more than 10 centimeters square. Vena contract the width of more 0.7, PISA radius more than 0.9. Dense triangular uh, continuous wave Doppler jet, systolic flow reversal in hepatic veins and significantly dilated RB with reservoir functions. And this goes in favor of severe TR. So the moderate and the mild we have already discussed. If there is an indeterminate TR, then you can consider CMR or transesophageal echo in these cases. But um, the parameters which have been proposed are for transthoracic echo. Now, you can also look at the IVC collapsibility, and uh, this is something which is uh, we all know about. So, if look, depending on the IVC size and the collapsibility, you can uh, look at the uh, mean RA pressure. You can also take out the pulmonary artery systolic pressure by the TR jet method, which we all do all the time, the null equation. The well, one thing which I want to say about TR jet interrogation is that the analyzable TR jets are seen in uh, about 39, about 40 to 80 percent population. And the there is a significant correlation between the RVSP and what you saw find on the right heart cat. But when you talk about the pulmonary hypertension, arterial hypertension, the sensitive and specificity of Doppler derived PSP is about somewhere about 80 to 100 percent sensitivity and 60 to 98 uh, percent specificity. But there may be underestimation of PA pressures in severe pulmonary artery hypertension, and there may be an overestimation of PSP in the normal population. The other hemodynamic parameters is you can uh, look at the PADP by the PR jet. You can take out the mean PA pressures with the help of the tricuspid regurgitation jet as well as the uh, PADP. So there are three, four methods. One is the peak PR velocity plus RA pressure, uh, which is through like this. You can also calculate it with systolic PA pressure and PADP, PA systolic and PADP uh, mean pressure can be calculated. And then you also have the equation where RVOP acceleration time can be uh, used in this equation, which is known as the Mahan equation. You can also trace the tricuspid valve uh, VTI to take out the mean pressure. So there are various ways by which you can uh, take out the mean PA pressure, but please understand that for diagnosing pulmonary hypertension, you still have to do a right heart cath to be sure. PVR estimation can also be done with the help of tricuspid regression velocity. So you take the peak TR velocity in meter per second and divide it by the RVOT VTI, uh, which is here, we have taken it here, into 10 plus 0.16. So like in this case, it is about 5.16 Woods units. To convert it into dynes, uh, you have to multiply it with uh, 80. CMR uh, is also one of the good modalities for tricuspid valve, also looking at the RB, RA volumes, RB function. But the limitation is that the flow cannot be separated from the 2D structure imaging. And the normal tricuspid valve is just about one millimeter thick. So unless the valve has pathology and it is thickened, the CMR may not be able to visualize it very well. And the flow cannot be separated from the 2D structural imaging, unlike the color Doppler in echo. And the turbulence creates a flow disturbance. So it is not yet validated for usual tricuspid valve, as a tricuspid regurgitation assessments. Now, when we talk about the management part, I'm going to briefly touch upon the concepts and we please understand that we are talking more about these. Here is the secondary or functional DR. We have these latest 2021 JAMA, um, which has shown that the determinants of mortality and morbidity is with isolated tricuspid valve is high. 
So if you don't treat isolated secondary PR, the mortality is high and morbidity is also mm -hmm. high. Patients develop right heart failure, et cetera. The in-hospital mortality rate is with associated with isolated PR is mainly related to late referral to surgery. So this is very, very important that a strategy for early referral is very important in these patients. Otherwise, I have seen a lot of people harboring the views that TR is innocuous, let it be, patient is doing all right. But we have shown, uh, most of the recent studies have shown that late referral is the main reason for high mortality of tricuspid valve surgeries. The prognosis of secondary TR uh, if you look at the general population, there is an increased mortality in patients with HEFF, it is a prognostic marker. Patients with LV dysfunction, severe TR leads to 55% increase in mortality. Those who are referred for heart transplant, there is heart, severe TR denotes 50% more cardiovascular risk events. There is an increased mortality uh, uh, in patients with significant isolated TR. As I said earlier, that even if your mitral and aortic valve is okay or your LV function is okay, still the isolated TR cannot be ignored and has high mortality. Associated TR increases, AR increases mortality risk. And there is aortic valve surgery for your AS with severe TR or mitral valve surgery also increases the risk of mortality and morbidity. The mechanism, as I was saying, there is atrial dilatation as an AF. There may be a structural uh, valvular heart disease, LV dysfunction, or pulmonary disease leading to pulmonary hypertension, atrial arrhythmias, RV enlargement and geometrical changes, leaflet tethering or tricuspid valve, tricuspid annulus dilatation in the sept septolateral um, um, plane, or leading to ultimately annular dilatation, leaflet tethering. There is a jet height and jet area, uh, the area of the tether, tethered area, et cetera, which you can calculate, which leads to secondary TR. Now, if despite optical med medical, medical management in patients with severe secondary TR, there is a progression of the symptoms, RV dilatation and RV dysfunction, which is progressive. So you define RV dysfunction with tapsid that's in 17 millimeter, RV strain, which is uh, more than point, minus 25 means it's going down, minus 25, minus 23, 20, 20, minus 20, et cetera, like that. If the strain is <coughs> using the systolic wave less than 10 and FAC less than 35, this is the criteria for RV dysfunction. If there is uh, RV dilatation with RV volume more than 100 ml per meter square, or there is an irreversible elevation of PA pressure or vascular resistance of more than three volts units, then you uh, take these patients for medical therapy. Um, if there is no such RV dysfunction, the patient is with comorbidities and high surgical risk, you can go for uh, the prosthetic annuloplasty in these cases. So a lot of transcatheter interventions are coming up. Um, if this is not possible, then tricuspid valve replacement can be surgically done. So you can, the first, proper choice is tricuspid valve repair. If the patient has high surgical risk, you should discuss percutaneous treatment in these patients. And when you are looking at the surgical feasibility, do you have to look at the increase the anterior leaflet with autologous pericardial patch if the tethering height is more than eight millimeter or tethering area is more than 16 centimeters square, 1.6 centimeters square. And you should do the left heart valve surgery if it is required at the time of tricuspid valve involved uh, surgery. Now, if you look at the European and the American guidelines published in 2017 and 14, the way they uh, recommend uh, for uh, the STR management and the recommendation for surgery is class 2A in ESC and class 2B in ACC guidelines that isolated tricuspid valve surgery should be considered after previous left-sided valve surgery in patients with severe secondary TR who are symptomatic, who have progressive RV dilatation or dysfunction, and in the absence of severe RV or LV dysfunction or severe pulmonary hypertension. So these are the guidelines which stand. 
and isolated tricuspid valve surgery may also be considered in those patients even if they do not have a previous left sided valve surgery so that's a 2013 guidelines you please remember that the normal tricuspid annular diameter is about 28 plus minus 5 mm in the apical four chamber view in diastole in healthy adults so the current guidelines suggest that the threshold diameter is more than 40 mm uh, of the tricuspid uh, the diameter or annulus or more than 21 mm per meter square body surface area to recommend combined tricuspid valve annuloplasty at the time of left sided valve surgery the tv surgery mortality rate is about 8 to 10% and this is basically because of late referrals very very important so you avoid onset of chf rv dysfunction liver disease or renal failure surgery should be performed much earlier the tricuspid valve surgery for str should be a repair whenever possible so go for annuloplasty the tv replacement which is almost always a bioprosthetic valve will be performed only when the tricuspid leaflets are significantly tethered or the annulus is severely dilated because tvr per se is associated with poorer perioperative and long term uh, long term outcomes as compared to tv repair so the emerging uh, ways of treatment of tr is the percutaneous or transcatheter interventions like you can have a transcatheter or tricuspid valve replacement you will have a bicaval uh, implantation and many more like mitra clip can be used for tricuspid valves and then you have forma cardio band uh, tri clench all these are the upcoming strategies for tricuspid valve i think the next decade we'll see a lot more percutaneous transcatheter uh, treatment as compared to surgery thank you thank you very much virak i think it was a brilliant presentation right from the anatomy to physiology to hemodynamics and to various grades of classification various methods of classification and quantification It was really lovely. Thank you. Before we open to discussion, uh, the session, I just got one or two important clarification. I was very impressed by one of the slides of Vinayak. When I worked 33 years ago in the United States and spent one year on practice with Vinayak, you'll be amazed, Vinayak. I was given a specimen of heart. and told me to tell me the hemodynamics of the motion of annulus and i went to harrison's library and sat from 11 o'clock in the night to 3 o'clock in the morning and produced 50 papers next day oh. with the way nine said and the same thing hold true today 21 mm per meter square and 40 mm it has not been challenged It's a real privilege and very honor, and this slide has still preserved and shown by Vinayak. It makes me really gratified that work is appreciated. I have only one question: When I worked for one year on this, I used to go night and night in the lab. The question was: The patients who to undergo surgery for aortic valve or or mitral valve rheumatic heart disease. when they undergo tricuspid annuloplasty with that criteria which you just mentioned does the prognosis really improve does the mortality really improve is there a data because that time i was just working retrospective not prospective <clears throat> so is there any data to say that anybody who is the uh, annulus diameter is more than 40 mm or more than 21 mm per meter square if simultaneously along with the aortic valve replacement or mitral valve replacement or double valve replacement we do simultaneous angioplasty or tricuspid angioplasty then the prognosis definitely improves i like to have your comments so like so sir i think the recent last 3 years uh, data i have seen and <clears throat> there is a very clear uh, you know Uh, clear uh, data which has emerged is that if you if you look at the overall mortality of surgical intervention in uh, secondary tr 
there is about 8 to 10 percent mortality but most of them are related to the fact that patients reach very late and if you were to actually go ahead and do it at a much earlier a stage then the mortality is definitely lower but what we do know is that if you don't intervene then the mortality is definitely higher so if you if you look at uh, you know there is also a staging of tricuspid regurgitation based on uh, annular diameter and <clears throat> in the stage uh, so i mean even you know uh, there the uh, edge to edge repair tricuspid annuloplasty or leaflet augmentation etc they are being uh, proposed now as uh, treatment for functional tr and i think uh, what we are trying to see and we, what the data is now clearly showing is that uh, if you intervene early the patients definitely have a better prognosis in the long run and uh, we should intervene in these tricuspid uh, uh, severe tr patients the moment we start seeing uh, you know some form of dysfunction or rv dilatation etc the criteria which i showed you I think so, it's a brilliant message given by Vinayak. Any patient who's undergoing a left-sided surgical surgical intervention, we should consider tricuspid valve annuloplasty to improve the prognosis and reduce the morbidity and mortality. There is a huge data. Vinayak also pointed out a very important thing that the emerging things are now transcatheter tricuspid valve clipping. I mean, it's a very good slide. And the future is that, and I'm sure a lot of people will do a tricuspid endoplasty, or they may even do what we call as coaptation enhancement. There are all the techniques which they are going to use, or a direct suturing endoplasty, or a ring endoplasty, which is going to be the future. I think it was a brilliant slide shown by Vinayak. I'm really grateful to him. A lot of work has been done by Dr. Azim Latib, and uh, his whole data. is very well appreciated all over the world and he has shown that with this technique of percutaneous there is a reduction in mortality at least over a year that's what he has shown but we need more data to say so and just one more question clinically uh, there was like to add this thing so there there was a very recent uh, article from korea where in 2020 with in prevention heart where they've shown that if the uh, annular dilatation is more than 44 mm it's probably better to replace the tricuspid valve rather than repair so i think we are emerging with more and more data uh, as in the last 2 3 years and i i think the guidelines will uh, show a lot of change in the next guideline change that we see you will see a lot of uh, you know um, difference just a last question before we see the chat box uh you mentioned about the various causes of organic tr we see dilated ra dilated rv rv cardiomyopathy and we also seen a lot of patients having rv thrombus and rv thrombus with a very high risk for pulmonary embolism do you think that if we start early novak in these patients it may reduce thromboembolism i have no idea this is my real question atrial fibrillation is very common when the ra size increases or the ra pressure increases we like to have your comments before i open it to the chat box like right. so so we are clearly there is uh, you know if we treat these patients based on the atrial fibrillation uh, which is like a valvular af and for whatever reason it may be whether it is a mitral or tricuspid valve disease and we treat them uh, uh, no ax we so the only three indications which we can say where no acts are contraindicated are one moderate to severe mitral stenosis mechanical heart valves and first three months of bioprosthetic uh, uh, implantation barring those i think we can use no acts in almost any kind of valvular that's, okay yeah. so that's a very important message i think uh, which we all should consider in the era of no act today which we can use in lot of patients Vinayak, there are some questions for you, Doctor Hitanshu Panchal. How reliable is EPO-derived mean pulmonary artery pressure values as compared to the right heart catheterization, Doctor Vinayak Agarwal? 
That's a very good question. Um, we know that it is uh, not very reliable in severe pulmonary hypertension, but doing a right heart cath is something which uh, is not easy, not very well uh, um, available. And in most cases, uh, we, uh, barring the group one uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, we hardly uh, propose the use of, you know, right heart cath in day-to-day -day usage. And uh, me, we, we usually use PA, PASP as one of the uh, surrogates for decision-making processes in pulmonary hypertension. But you're right that uh, we, uh, we cannot, if, you, if we go by the uh, guidelines which are proposed for pulmonary hypertension diagnosis, then right heart cath still remains the modality of choice for uh, the correct classification. In fact, for CTPH, the new guidelines have uh, reduced it from 25 to 20 millimeter of mercury for the group four CTPH. So, but still, I would say that uh, one should calculate it and uh, write it and with its uh, limitations that we know. Thank you, Vinak. There's one more question from you uh, for you, Dr. Vinayak Wadgaonkar. What is the mechanism of atrial functional TR apart from annular dilatation and management options in medically managed uh, refractory patients? Dr. Vinayak Agro. So I think uh, that's a good question because the, uh, right, it, the atrial fibrillation induced uh, um, contribution of AF into severe TR or secondary TR is multifocal. So it can it is related to not only the annular dilatation because of the right atrial dilatation. So the atrial contribution as the as as the RA enlarges, the so does the annulus in the septolateral uh, plane. There is also tithering of the leaflets which occurs. There is also more of uh, less of. Um, and there is also uh, atrial ischemia. There is also function of right ventricular dysfunction, which contributes. So there are multiple mechanisms which have been, uh, which have shown the, uh, you know, progression of TR in patients of atrial fibrillation. And if you treat them well, we know that there is, that is the dynamicity of variability of TR. So if you give diuretics, if you're able to convert AF into a normal sinus rhythm, if you are able to treat the underlying etiology which led to it, then it is also partly reversible. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vilak. There's another question by Dr. Biswaranjan Mishra. He's asked, in significant mitral regurgitation with higher LV ejection fraction values are taken as LV dysfunction. Is there any such recommendation in tricuspid regurgitation or RV dysfunction. Uh, sorry, can you again come, sir? Yeah, I just read the question. In yeah. significant mitral regurgitation, higher ejection fraction values are taken as LV dysfunction. Yeah. Is there any such recommendation TR for RV dysfunction? Yeah. So, see, uh, what is proposed is so RV dysfunction is very uh, simply if you have a tapsel less than 17, if you have RV strain uh, less than 25, if you have uh, S uh, prime of less than 10, or FAC uh, fr fraction area change of less than 35%, these are the standard parameters to denote RV dysfunction very clearly. And you also can add RV volume if it is more than 100 ml per meter square body surface area as one of the criteria, which I showed as the sign of RV dilatation or dysfunction. So these are the criteria in which once you have that, then that is, uh, you know, when you start doing medical therapy is going on and then you look at the patient uh, for surgical correction. The last question for you, Dr. Vinayak Agrawal, is from Professor... Shehbaz Qureshi, in a patient with an interior wall MI, uh, interior wall MI, patent LED, and severe TR, what is the prognosis and what should be done in the medical treatment and intervention, Professor Shehbaz? So, 
an anterior wall mi i am assuming that anterior wall mi has led to a severe lb dysfunction and hence a uh, severe tr must be a uh, hypertensive tr which is because of the left ventricular failure and in these cases you treat the left sided pathology so uh, if led is patent then either it can be minoca which is myocardial infarction with non obstructive coronary artery disease it could be myocarditis which is presenting as an mi kind of a situation which you're seeing a lot in the covid scenario either way it is a left sided dysfunction which is which can be either lv dysfunction severe mitral regurgitation associated we must rule out any significant aortic valve pathology which is leading to the tricuspid regurgitation so we can treat them according to the underlying etiology which is the anterior wall mi or lv dysfunction to take care of the tr another question by dr Hitanshu Panchal, is there any role of afterload reduction in reducing medicines like ARB, ACE inhibitors, nitroglycerin, plus hydralazine in treating severe tricuspid regurgitation? What's your opinion? Good night. So most of these therapy are basically for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and we talk about the LB here for the right ventricular heart or right. sided heart failure mainly it is diuretics and uh, supporting medications and treating the underlying etiology so there is no proven role of these therapies uh, for the tr or right sided uh, rv dysfunction thank you dr vilak dr krishna swami chandrashekaran he is asking if it is simultaneously done Hemodynamics are similar between cath and echo Doppler. If we do simultaneously both cath and echo, are the hemodynamics same in tricuspid regurgitation? So, if there is no significant pulmonary hypertension, they are pretty closely related. But uh, in severe pulmonary hypertension, we may be underestimating the PA pressures. Uh, so, the cath data is going to be more reliable. Dr. Govinda Paul, when RA, RV pressure equalization in case of severe TR, how can we calculate pulmonary artery systolic pressure from Dr. Govinda Paul for you, Bangladesh? So the peak uh, of, uh, I mean, the contour which you get is uh, typically triangular. because of the rapid uh, equalization and ventricularization of the pressures but uh, most of such uh, tr um, i mean you just take the peak and you calculate the pa pressures if there is low pressure tr or high pressure tr is a different number most of them will be low pressure trs but uh, that you calculate the pa pressure according to that now the last question uh, dr vilak agarwal for you dr vidya Uh, Surat Kal, please describe again how to view by TEE the ATR, ATL, STL, and PTL. So you have this uh, on record. So this recording is there. You can always revisit uh, this talk and on the IAE platform. And uh, I think you can just revisit it. I have already shown you the transthoracic and the TEE ways to uh, which to identify which leaflet is which one. So, from the core of my heart, ladies and gentlemen, I express my gratitude and thanks to Dr. Vinayak Agarwal for his brilliant exposition on tricuspid regurgitation. Thank you, sir. From quantitation to the management as an example. I think he's given a lot of value addition, and he has also predicted what is going to be the future. It was a brilliant presentation by Dr. Vinayak Agarwal. I'm really very grateful to you. In last, I must say, ladies and gentlemen, I assure you that the beautiful expression and the words and the data and logistics used by Dr. Vinayak Agarwal will enhance new understandings. and implications in our clinical practice of cardiology for evaluation prognostication and treatment of tricuspid regurgitation 
I always conclude with a very important word or important expression. And the expression is like this. We learn from yesterday. We live for today. And we hope for tomorrow. I'm sure in my heart, the next year, you will see Dr. Vinayak Agarwal coming to you with a lot of advances in the therapeutic intervention of tricuspid reconsideration by percutaneous technology. Thank you very much, Vinayak. Thank I you. from the heart and thanks to all the audience who interacted so nicely and had good questions to make this uh, session a very interesting session. Thank you. Thank you very much.